Glad to have your company today. This is the 10th of June, Friday, and nice to be able to share with you on this feast of St. Ephraim, although a little bit confusing because, indeed, as uh, was a Catherine was pointing out yesterday, the breviary says this, that the 9th of June is the Feast of St. Ephraim of Syria, and yet the um, liturgical calendar this year says it's the 10th. So I'm a little bit confused. We've had this twice now with St. Charles Ulwanga being moved from the 3rd to the 4th of June. It may be to do with the fact of St. Columba yesterday. I am not sure of being a feast day and Ephraim moved forward. Don't, I'm not uh, I'm not in charge of these things, so I have no idea. At any rate, we'll give St. Ephraim a little mention here today. A native of Mesopotamia, a place called Nisibis. Uh, the year 306, he goes way, way, way back as one of the fathers of the church, Syria, his country of origin. He was baptised around the year 324, joined the cathedral school there, of which he later became the head. And the Persians then captured Nisibis in 363. There seems to be an awful lot of coming and going with uh, empires in that part of the world, even back in the day. And this is prior, of course, to Islam even as well. Uh, just you know, the Babylonian captivity, just reminding, you know, remind of that, uh, toing and froing in sacred scripture in the Old Testament, the Israelites captured and then up and down to Egypt and back and all of these things. Um, there's a lot of empires shifting uh, there in the Middle East, uh, going again back long before our time. So uh, no wonder it seems that there, there's a volatility about those countries even still. Uh, after the Persians captured it, then uh, Ephraim became a monk. He was living in a cave near Edessa, and there he wrote exegetical works, meaning uh, exegesis is... Um, expounding on and expanding on sacred scripture and uh, explaining. Hermeneutics is another word that can be used for that too. Um, and he wrote hymns which were later incorporated into the liturgy and translated into several languages. In the year 370, he visited St. Basil, whose brother Gregory of Nyssa wrote in his praise. So St. Basil and Gregory are um, celebrated together as well as another Saint's Day of the Fathers of the Church. In 372 he organised charity to victims of famine and he died soon afterwards in his cave. His voluminous works earned him the title of the doctor as doctor of the church in the year 1920. So again we're going back to the, the early church fathers and I would love to get an expert in I know next to nothing I would be just we we did a little short course on what's called patristics when we were students for the priesthood uh, in the seminary and sure listen I think most of it was, went over my head we had learned the names and the dates and the sort of basic tenets of some of the fathers of the church and their teachings and writings but it's a whole area of study patrology again is another word given to it the study of the father's pater meaning father patrick you know that idea of of a father um and, and so it's a whole area that we would it'd be lovely to find somebody who knows something about these things or has studied these things or is <laughs> a bit more up to speed uh, to share with us a, a little course with you here on the radio on patrology. We simply add it to the wallpaper, as I say here. We just have a list as long as a roll of wallpaper of all the wonderful programming that we would love to share with you and the topics and areas of <clears throat> uh, study and so on. It will be great to be able to do that. So with God's help and in time and with a little bit of patience, we'll get there with all of that too. Uh, let me see here. I had a message here from um, someone who's on the Camino de Compostela. Um, the uh, Campino de, Is this the Camino de Santiago de Compostela? The Camino St. James. But 150 kilometers east of um, Santiago in and around uh, Galicia, which was where our good friend uh, Jesus was from. Jesus, who was here with us for some time. Um, there is a little church there where there is a Eucharistic miracle dating way back. And it's a small little town up in the mountains, more often than not shrouded in fog, it tells me here. And the miracle occurred back in the 13th century. It seems that there were Eucharistic miracles um, being made manifest. There must have been an awful dearth of faith. Did you know, the faith must have gone away to almost nothing. And the story is quite poignant in its own way. It says, um, sometime around the year 1300, a certain farmer named Juan Santin from the nearby hamlet of Barchamayor, 
having such a great devotion to the holy sacrifice of the Mass that no labor nor inclemency of weather could prevent him from hearing Mass, battled his way through ice and, and snow of a furious winter storm up the steep mountain pass to the little Benedictine monastery of the Church of Santa Maria of Thebreiro. Um, uh, Nuri was helping me to try to pronounce that name, Thebreiro. Small little little uh, village, there's some Benedictine monks there. So this uh, wonderful farmer, Juan Santin, uh, exhausted and soaked through to the skin, reached the church just as one of the monks was preparing to offer Holy Mass. The priest, a little anticipating that anyone should make their way to the church to hear Mass in such violent weather, had lost faith in the Holy Sacrifice that he was preparing to offer. He Maybe he sort of lapsed into a kind of mechanical approach to the celebration of the Holy Eucharist and just gave up on his faith in the Real Presence saying to himself, who would come all this way in such weather just to gaze upon a bit of bread and wine? So he thought to himself, and he belittled the poor man's faith, admonishing him for what he deemed a foolhardy and reckless journey. The sacrifice for what? Confronted with this scandalous lack of faith, this is the, the farmer now, the humble farmer, offered no response to the priest's uncharitable rebuke. The priest in turn proceeded to offer the Mass, albeit in a careless and hurried fashion. Does that sound familiar to you? Uh, it may be, and sadly, the case. It seems at times that there are priests who seem to not realize the, the gift and mystery that they are privileged to offer. Then, uh, the story is told by uh, Fra Antonio, then it was that the Lord, who works his wonders in the depths of the earth, in the hidden places of the world, the still small voice, again up Mount Horeb, sounds familiar uh, from our reading earlier at Mass. He so revealed his glory in that church that transforming the host into flesh and the wine into blood, he opened the eyes of that miserable minister who had doubted, the re- and who had doubted and rewarded. The minister who had doubted and rewarded such great devotion as that good man had shown in coming to hear Mass with so many discomforts. As he pronounced the words of consecration, the faithless priest was astonished to find that the host in his hands had perceptibly changed into flesh, drops of blood falling from his fingers and staining the corporal, while the wine in the chalice had been visibly transformed into blood. Terrified and overwhelmed with remorse for his lack of faith, he fell to his knees before the altar and exclaimed like St. Thomas, My Lord and my God. The faith of the humble Juan had been confirmed, his devotion rewarded, and the monk cured of his disbelief. The remains of the monk and the peasant Juan Santin are buried inside the church, and their modest mausoleums located at a side altar between a Romanesque image of the Virgin and Child on the Wall and the sealed reliquary containing the relics of the Eucharistic miracle and the chalice and pattern used at the Mass. So a picture that was just uh, sent through to me there this morning. And uh, absolutely lovely story. The miracle story, of course, um, spread rapidly throughout the whole of Europe Uh, carried by returning pilgrims on the uh, Camino and uh, endorsed, of course, by ecclesial documents as well and by hymns and songs and stories composed uh, as a result. So, uh, Thebreiro then became associated with Mount Salva, the mountain of Arthurian legend and the chalice of the miracle with the Holy Grail, which Galahad finds there. I'll never link that into secular culture. Um, so, and I think the um, an image of it, that there's a local flag, apparently, that this image of the Eucharistic miracle is on as well. And we just love to get a little, in quick little story for you there. Sebreiro, if you're looking it up. C-E-B-R-E-I-R-O. C-E-B-R-E-I-R-O. Uh, and the story goes on there. I'll leave that for you to look up in your own time. 
But lovely indeed that we have such Eucharistic miracles to bolster our faith. Certainly it's scandalous and should not be the case that a priest would um, all, you know, lose faith in the Blessed Sacrament in that way and become very casual or very perfunctory in it and in fact uh, admonishing the, the faith of the the, the farm, the simple farmer who had battled through all the weathers to get to the um, to church, to get to mass, you know, um, and so it throws it back on us. Then, what level or uh, what? How? Where is our faith in relation to all of these things, and in in the real presence? Um, so it's well worth challenging ourselves uh, in that regard too. So very good. Um, Here's a question that has come in. Uh, What is the significance of the Holy Family going into Egypt? Is it to make up for what the earlier Jews lacked? Hmm. That now I don't know. I think there is some very interesting parallels, though, the flight into Egypt. Uh, I I can't say who sent that message in. It just uh, came into our little uh, question group, the little WhatsApp group we have for your questions and and, uh, texts to us. But the interesting significance of going to Egypt, the flight into Egypt, is reminiscent of the Old Testament departure of the Jews to Egypt under Jacob. Jacob and his family, there was a terrible famine. There was a great want at the time. And in Egypt, of course, Joseph, his youngest son, his favorite son, who was sold into slavery, becomes the breadwinner for the family, uh, the family of Jacob and, and Israel, as Jacob was known which is symbolic of the people of of Israel too, God's chosen people. And so the Holy Family taking flight to Egypt on account of a a famine, this time the destruction of the innocents, a famine, a kind of uh, rejection of life and, and, you know, an awful want of respect for human life. That too can be described as a famine or worse, in, in some ways, but not just a food, of course, but of morality. And here the Holy Family head into Egypt and Joseph of the Holy Family becomes the breadwinner for the Holy Family and ultimately the breadwinner in bearing Christ, the bre- who become the bread of life, as the Eucharistic miracle helps us understand, bearing that back to the people of Israel first, the last tribes of the people of Israel, the people of God that the Lord comes to preach to first and then to the whole world. So I think there, there, there's a deep significance going on there, echoing back from the New Testament to the Old Testament and ultimately deliverance from slavery in Egypt to freedom in Christ, the great exodus that took place. So return out of Egypt back to the promised land. So I would say there's the deep significance of the Holy Family's flight into Egypt and a striking um, a striking r- resemblance or a striking not, res- not isn't sort of connection maybe with the Old Testament for the Jewish people I mean, how could they miss this how could this significance uh, not uh, impact on them like how more obvious does it, the Lord have to make it and Bethlehem of course where the Lord was born Bayit Lechem House of bread is the literal translation there. Um, the Lord laid in a, in a manger, manger, to eat a trough from which the animals would eat from, and the Lord becoming the bread of life. I am the bread of life. How can they miss all these inferences in sacred scripture? How can otherwise good Christians who simply don't believe in the real presence of Jesus in the Holy Eucharist miss this, and yet they love sacred scripture so much? And then how can we, like that monk, Back in uh, Thebreiro, back in the in the around the year 1300, again, how could he fail to see the reality of Christ in the Holy Eucharist as as given and handed on? He had lost faith. It, it is a, a a a step of faith. So the the flight to Egypt um, certainly the case. Certainly the case. Uh, oh, thanks, Catherine. Catherine sent in a text there. Um, uh, St. Ephraim is uh, today, uh, apparently it's on EWTN too. So I, I'm not sure <clears throat> why it is that the breviary then, we've had two dates now on the breviary, Charles Wenger for the 3rd of June and St. Ephraim on the 9th of June. Both were moved by a day, one to the 4th, one to the 10th. 
in in the liturgical calendar. So there's still a bit of a somebody made a decision somewhere and the memo wasn't sent around. <laughs> or it's just that the breviary dates back to uh, the early 1970s. And so there obviously must have been some little bit of moving around of those those feast days. At any rate, I'm glad we did get it right. And we had put it out to you <laughs> in the early days when the calendar was on, you know, our calendar radio, our calendar was in circulation um, to point out uh, we'd give a prize. There was no prize, of course. But if you spot any mistakes in the calendar, and we know there was definitely one or two in there. <laughs> so thanks to our captain, this kind of confirmation that I'm not going crazy. We're not, <clears throat> we're not um, missing the point or, or losing the plot or any of those other things as well. So very good. Uh, so do text in, do email in. That's great. I like the little conversation here with you. And it just helps to explore different topics and different areas of our faith and morality, which are very important. So please do text 0894672000. We would love to hear from you any time of the day or night. If you're listening back as a podcast, if you're listening back later or watching back later again, drop a comment on Facebook and YouTube as well and send us in your reactions or thoughts or questions uh, as as you wish, as you feel inspired. And we'll do our best to attend to those. 89 Four six seven two thousand is the text and WhatsApp number. And again, if you're in the north or outside of Ireland, plus three five three eight nine four six seven two thousand. Now, Chris is very kindly volunteering this morning too, and Mary and Martina are ready and waiting at the telephone to answer your calls. O one four one two three four five six. O one four one two three four five six. Or plus three five three again outside of. Um, uh, Ireland or in the north plus three five three one four one two three four five six and uh, please email info at radiomaria.ie likewise a reminder again if you'd like to come with us to Glendalough we're going next Thursday we'll have Holy Mass from Glendalough uh, please call at 10am and we're going to meet at St Kevin's in Lorach is how I would pronounce it or Lara maybe as others might L-A-R-A-G-H and that's in Glendalough. So if you Google that, Lara St. Kevin's Church, you can meet us there for 10 o'clock Mass. We're going to head across then to Glendalough itself and visit the monastic site and have a little prayer there and stroll around, enjoy the two lakes and have a little bring your own pack lunch, a little sandwich and a drink or something next to the lakes there. It's a little get together. And we are hoping we can get somebody locally maybe to give us a little tour, a little explanation of the, the site too. If not, we can do a bit of Googling and wing it along ourselves and do the best we can. But it's a beautiful location and please God we'll have nice weather for it. So a little faith pilgrimage, a little faith journey as part of our ongoing trips here on Radio Maria Ireland. We've been, of course, to St. Mel's Cathedral. And do check out the videos that uh, Nuria has posted up this week of the tour of St. Mel's Cathedral and of the wonderful story of the miraculous image of the Holy Family that Kitty Ross uh, very enthusiastically explains there. We've boosted that on our Facebook page. It's there on our YouTube channel. Have a scroll through and have a look and in your own time listen to that fabulous story as well. Kitty tells it with such great conviction as an eyewitness to the fire that destroyed the cathedral utterly in 2009 and preserved this miraculous image of the Holy Family. Uh, a symbol and a sign and a message for our times, absolutely no doubt. So lovely to get that story, lovely to capture it on video and it's there for you to look as well. You maybe weren't able to come with us to St. Mel's but you can come with us virtually. And of course our trip to Maynooth will, please God, maybe have some a video there to share with you and our trip to Knock was another trip as well and we'll share some uh, in due course of that trip with you too. So this is our next trip, our fourth, fourth trip now to Glendalough. So we have so many beautiful places around Ireland of, uh, immersed in our faith and just well worth sharing with the world through Radio Maria and sharing with you as well and especially if it is that for any reason the circumstances you're not able to go out and about you're not able to travel these things are uh, outside of your scope at the moment then we'll go on your behalf we'll bring you with us spiritually and you can watch back and listen back and look back at uh, those visits as well and participate in them remotely as we say too 
Now, maybe just a few thoughts before we go to a break and just open up that conversation a little bit further on the gospel this morning and the very challenging words of Jesus to us. And I remember often trying to teach this or speak of this in the classroom and schools to fifth and sixth years, always with the uh, senior students. And uh, that very line of the Lord's deeply challenging that any man who looks at a woman with a lust in his heart has already committed adultery with her. And if ever there was a, a sin uh, that is prevalent today, now you can list it off with the other six deadly sins too. Pride, anger, lust, envy, greed, gluttony, sloth. They're all in there as deadly sins and, and one as deadly as the next. And we find ourselves prone to these weeds in the garden of the soul. And I just love that analogy of, of gardening. It's just so apt when it comes to the spiritual life. And lust is one of those nasty thistles or, I don't know, these weeds that just have deep roots and are, are hard to, to extricate. And temptations in this way affect us deeply. And if anything, that should already begin to teach us a very important lesson and give us a very deep insight into the nature and gift of our human sexuality, that it is such that um, sins or transgressions against this gift have seem to affect us very deeply. And they're very personal and they're very embarrassing, maybe, too. God has put all of that there. I mean, why should they be embarrassing? Why should we feel it so deeply? Except that it concerns our very nature. There's something about the gift and beauty of human sexuality that it is in such a way integrated and conjoined with the spiritual because we're co-operating with, in the power that we've been given through our sexuality, God's life-giving love. So there's a deep connection there between uh, the, the gift of life and the calling to love. And, and that's very personal and personable. And indeed, our own nature, we you know, cover those parts of our body naturally in relation to these areas. Again, uh, not so much out of a spirit of, of shame, but because this is a, a sacred part of our nature and our being that we wouldn't like anyone else to abuse or to interfere with. And we lament deeply and, and express continued sorrow for the terrible, shameful crimes and sins of lust, especially in the church, and continue to express sorrow to all victims of, of sexual abuse, especially through the church and members of the church who should know better. And we continue to bring that to prayer. Our lunchtime prayer here every day for the church in Ireland echoes that very remorse and desire to rebuild trust and confidence and to rebuild and grow and try to understand all the more deeply the sacred gift of our human sexuality. So if nothing else, we, we can at least begin there, I hope, and see what um, this delicate and sensitive part of our nature teaches us about the sanctity of life and the sacredness of the human person and the dignity of each man and woman, that we are not objects to be used for the pleasure of others. We are subjects to be loved. And I mean love in this in the self-sacrificial sense, not in the grasping at and in the laying claim to or in the use or abuse of as if we are an object. So because we have this uh, sacred gift that it's a bit of a mystery in its own right too, and it confounds us uh, to the extent that our nature is fallen, our w will is weakened, and our intellect is darkened, and we're, we're broken creatures, in, in a sense, by sin. And our proclivity to sin in this area, as in so many other areas too, again teaches us something about uh, the need for God's grace and, the, the, again, the delicacy and fragility, really, of our nature, especially in this regard. So I'm always careful to kind of circumscribe this topic in that way so that we understand very clearly 
that look we it in in the nature of the topic we're we're speaking of the idea of lust in the heart and the question of the abuse of this this gift we've received we can learn some very basic sort of fundamental principles and ideas that this is a beautiful gift we've been given it's from god because we cooperate with the use of this gift in bringing new life into the world it's integral into our identity as human beings that it's not something you can turn a switch and flip it off. <laughs> you can't take it out and put it away. It's it's integral to who we are and part of our identity as man and woman, as male and female. And and it's it's something awesome and something mysterious and yet a, a great blessing. And at the same time, so very, very fragile and so very delicate and to be treated with uh, great respect and care. So I'm going to just uh, move into those thoughts a little bit more after our music break, if I may, and invite you to participate in that conversation with me too. And again, it's an, an always an open-ended conversation. But we're uh, circumnavigating a little bit the commandments. And of course, this the sixth commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. This is the very commandment the Lord is quoting for us on the Mount in the Sermon on the Mount for us today. So we're kind of just these past few chatechises speaking about the, the nature of commandments and our understanding of them and their place in the moral and the spiritual life too. So please do text in 089-467-2000. Uh, any questions? We don't have to put your name to it either if it's one of those delicate matters or uh, embarrassing if, you know, ones that we might find a little bit embarrassing to speak about. Um, you know, feel free to to uh, articulate again any concerns you might have. Uh, let's pause for a little piece of music, if we may. Again, o one four one two three four five six is the number to call to dial up here. O eight nine four six seven two thousand to text and drop a, a comment here on YouTube or, or Facebook as well, and uh, we can hear from you in that direction. Likewise, if you happen to be watching as well. So thanks, David. We'll uh, put on a little piece of music and back very shortly. Come true. 
and me but surrender to him his light will shine through I believe in me he is the word he is my guiding light spirit shining bright and I believe in miracles dreams that all come true my faith in him will shine my faith will see It sounds like the voice of Mark Forrest, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I believe in miracles. Anyway, they're for you. Uh, you might notice on Facebook that um, they have an automatic um, kind of cutoff thing that they block uh, commercial music if it has a, the commercial claim on it. Now, we pay our license fee here in, in Radio Maria, so we're licensed to broadcast these things. Um, Facebook and YouTube have their own set of rules, and it's hard to um, figure them out sometimes. Um, so if, if the, the video feed goes silent on you on Facebook that's the reason behind it they, they have their their own way of approaching these things we're not doing anything I don't think illegal by these things as far as I know so unless somebody wants to correct me and <laughs> straighten me out on that one as far as I can see we're, we're licensed to do these things uh, but that explains why sometimes on, on the social media channels there's there's silences there it's very good so the sixth commandment thou shalt not commit adultery the lord uh, making reference to this in the sermon on the mount in matthew chapter 5 for us this morning now we've covered this uh, many many times before uh, here on Chattachesis from time to time certainly on uchat as well you can scroll back through some of our uchat shows uh, it's a task we have in hand actually to try to catalog all of those a little bit better for reference purposes we're certainly working on our podcasting a little bit better these days and hoping moving forward to improve that into a very good library of content for you to access more easily uh, but we've also covered uh, pure in heart is the show that's on here every uh, tuesday between uh, four and five harry and uh, helen are very good to host that and they've covered every and any topic on that and uh, shared with us uh, some very good uh, written resources that are available on this whole area so it's, it's a massive area really to dive into but uh, as i was saying uh, you know as a starting point is here at least a starting point that i would uh, commence off on rather than taking the sort of negative um thou shalt not you know side of things first to say that look uh, in this commandment uh, we find that in our human nature we are blessed with this gift of human sexuality and it identifies our maleness and femaleness and we are called as followers of Christ then to integrate it and its use into our whole person a holistic you might say approach to how we use these gifts and the same is true of, of the other uh, elements of um, the, the flowers in the garden that we're trying to go the garden of the soul and not only chastity but uh, patience uh, kindness gentleness self-control and if we're honest to all these things we can put our hand up and say well look I'm not perfectly gentle I'm not perfectly patient I'm not perfectly charitable and if I'm honest I'm not perfectly chaste you know, and, and I'm not perfectly patient that how can I kind of come forward and say, like, like the Lord said to the men around the woman who was caught in adultery okay guys that he was without sin cast the first stone and fair play they got the message they got the memo they all dropped their stones because they realized look who can say they're without sin I mean to throw a stone in those that instance would have been to expose yourself to the scrutiny of all your family and friends and neighbors who would be the very first to step forward and point out any number of faults uh, and that's if we're honest and if we're humble enough to admit it true of all of us none of us is without sin 
Now, I suppose it's true in the order of nature that some people have a propensity to one sin as against another. I think that might have something to do even with temperament or circumstances or who knows, any, any other number of reasons that there may be some who find it so difficult to control their temper, others who find it very difficult to control their appetite, um, others then who maybe have an insatiable desire for power or possessions, and the same is true of addictions in relation to gambling, alcohol, drugs, and of sexuality too. Um, now, the world does not help. Man, it does not help. Um, that's me talking from personal experience here. Temptation is all over the gaff, as we say, all over the place. And uh, secular sources are, are, are replete with this. The In the area of human sexuality, pornography is a massive evil business of a you know, multi-billion dollar business. And sadly, with through the ubiquity of these smartphones and devices and things, it has become ever more accessible for old and young alike. Especially our young can be so easily and quickly corrupted in that area. So it must be so difficult for parents to monitor these things and protect the eyes and minds and hearts of their young boys and girls from this kind of material. And it is a real task at hand for mums and dads to find the appropriate time and the appropriate context with which to sit down with their children and say, look, this is not good. This is an abuse. And, you know, seeing images on display and, you know, it's, it's every shape and size of a thing um, that this is, is if, you know, if your eye should cause you to sin, pluck it out. If your hand should cause you to sin, cut it off. The Lord didn't mean that literally, obviously. But he said, well, this is the, radica the radicality of the reaction that's necessary to these things and with the help of God's grace. So if your smartphone should cause you to sin, well, maybe it's time to throw it out. <laughs> um, but again, it, it, it's a difficult call, isn't it? I mean, if a, a knife should cut you, should you throw it out? A knife is good for buttering the bread and for cutting, cutting the bread. And, and a smartphone, God loves it, certainly in, in our business it's, it's something you have to it's it's a useful tool but if these tools become weapons against us that's where we have to make the cut that's where we have to be drastic and try to eliminate it and humanly speaking again the, these things can be such a temptation and they're so um, appealing they're so easily accessible like i say and the whole area of pornography it's it's an endemic or pandemic would be the right word there's a very good document, if anybody wants to just follow through on a little bit of research on this, uh, written by Bishop Paul Loverdi. He's a retired bishop now of Arlington Diocese in Virginia, in the U.S. It's a number of years back. I used to uh, have it as a reference document for confession. Um, and, you know, I used to use it for penitence insofar as, again, judiciously deciding if it, this was suitable or not. But it's a very comprehensive and very well put together document addressing the modern phenomenon of pornography and addiction to these things as well. And the wreck and ruin it can bring into uh, marriage relationships and indeed the uh, destructive path it is for men in particular who are uh, more prone to these things, I would, I would suggest. But women are not immune from it either too. Because it's just it's just all over the place. It's very insidious. So the Lord putting before us again a very radical teaching that uh, when I mentioned this in schools, that I was saying the children would balk at this idea. They just this can't be possible, which struck me forcibly because it sounded to me like they're not getting much in the way of formation on this in their home life. If they're hearing the words of Jesus, any man who looks at a woman with sin in it, with lust in his heart commits adultery with her and they're throwing their hands up saying you know this is impossible well in a way that's the right reaction too and it's the reaction all of us should make that yes humanly speaking this is a very difficult command to live up to but we have a real task in hand to put structures in place so that we're not um, uh, you know exposing ourselves unnecessarily to these dangers it's a real weakness we have 
And I think God in his mercy has put into us a real sense of shame and guilt when it is that we fall victim to these temptations or commit these sins. And when we go to have to confess these, it's quite humiliating. And in a way, that's maybe a good deterrent in its own right, or at least a good way of, of um, acknowledging or um, seeing how it is that we might be failing in this regard and measuring it up. We, we Guilt is a, is a useful and helpful thing like that, and the embarrassment that accompanies it is helpful to keep us in mind that we shouldn't be using others. And then if we can grow in the positive way of looking upon others and seeing others as persons to be loved, subjects to be loved, as opposed to objects to be used for our gratification, then we're on the right path of integrating this lovely gift into our whole human person. And then, not without difficulty, simply come back to confession, come back to confession, come back to confession. Just keep returning to the sacraments, recognizing our propensities and our weaknesses, cultivating good habits of cutting off avenues of temptation and uh, being resolute in that regard by God's grace. Anyway, a, a very interesting conversation to continue and a very hot topic to discuss because there's many other avenues that could be explored. But we'll come back to it again. We'll, we'll uh, and I'll welcome indeed any comments or suggestions or lines of thought or thinking that I'd be happy to speak about as well. Now it's just coming up to 12 o'clock. Uh, thank you for your company today. Let's pause for our Angelus Bells and we'll pray together our midday prayer.